that's a signal of the public finally waking up, right? The banks wake up, the, finan- the financial players who see a little bit deeper what's going on in the derivative system, they, they make their moves in gold before the public finally wakes up. What makes the public wake up? Well, not the derivative markets, the supermarkets. That's what makes them wake up. And they, they, they go for silver. So we're going to see that at the very, very end. Um, and uh, where silver is going to go in the very, very end you know, of that, of that cycle in the hundreds, maybe even the thousands. I, I don't know. It, it depends. It, these numbers don't really mean anything when the dollar doesn't buy anything. So, I, I mean, it's anyone's guess, but I do think that the, the ratio at least briefly will fall to 15 to 1, which is what I'm waiting for. And when that happens, I'm just going to buy a bunch of stuff with silver and whatever I can't buy, I'll just convert back into gold. Financial journalist Rafi Farber emphasizes the surprising strength of gold which has maintained upward momentum without significant corrections in recent months. While Farber is cautious and prepared for possible declines of $50, $60, or even $100, he notes that silver is finally breaking out of a prolonged period of stagnation, currently trading above $34. Historically, silver tends to lag behind gold during bull markets. This pattern has been observed in both the late 1970s and the 2008 to 2011 periods, where silver ultimately surged after an initial phase of lackluster performance. As such, there is growing anticipation about how silver might react as market conditions shift. A critical factor contributing to silver's potential rise is its significant demand in military and aerospace applications, which has received less attention than its roles in consumer electronics and renewable energy. Recent analyses indicate that military demand for silver may surpass that of other sectors, raising important questions about the transparency of silver demand data. This hidden demand could position silver for a dramatic price increase as the market begins recognizing its true value. The precious metals market is currently experiencing notable shifts, particularly with gold's impressive performance and the unusually high short positions held by bullion banks. This combination fosters a sense of cautious optimism among traders, reminiscent of the 2008 to 2011 gold rally, during which prices continued to rise despite substantial short selling. Traders closely monitor these developments, understanding that if gold maintains its upward trajectory, it could lead to significant price movements in both gold and silver. The tension created by these high short positions could increase volatility, presenting opportunities for traders to profit from sudden price fluctuations. At the same time, interest in silver as an investment is growing. With rising inflation and the declining dollar purchasing power, analysts suggest that silver could experience substantial price increases, potentially reaching hundreds or even thousands of dollars per ounce. Now, we present the clips of Rafi Farber's insights from his recent interview. Before we continue to discuss this, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. What's surprising to me is that gold hasn't had any mu- much of any of a correction for uh, how long has it been? I don't even know. It's been months. Uh, on the one hand, like I'm emotionally ready for a correction. Uh, like if gold were to go down 50, 60, 70, even $100 in some kind of like little crunch, it wouldn't surprise me, but it's not happening. Um, and I looked at I looked at the, the the commitment of traders in gold, right? And uh, the worrying thing is that the bullion bank short positions are, are are very near a record high in gold. But what I also notice is that you go back all the way you all the way to um, 2008 2009 to 20, 2011, the strongest portion of the gold bull market of that era was two, that was after the 2008 crash, right? And then gold goes something from like 642 to 1923. What was it from October 2008 to September 2000? So about three years. It goes from six uh, it, more than it, more than triples about about triples. And in that in those three years, um, the the COTs, the commitment of traders, whose position what in the futures market? Um, if you trust those numbers, I don't completely trust them, but I think they're, ba- they're you know they're they're basically accurate, maybe. <laughs> Uh, they, they look very similar to now. And, uh, for all the, for most of those three years, the bullion bank shorts were, uh, were at or near records for three years. So I'm saying like, yeah, we're, we're in a dangerous position where you could get people knocked out if they're, especially if they're in leverage or doing some kind of crazy trading strategy with options, which I never, ever recommend. But those people could get, could get kicked out if they're just trend followers or if they're hedge funds or something. 
But then again, we could be, I mean, we had three years of this from 2008 to 2011. So we could have that again. And we could just keep going higher from here, just like we did in those years. I'm not going to try to play it. With silver, you know, silver didn't really make a move until 2010, 2011. So 2008, 2009, didn't do that much. Same thing in the 1970s, like from 1975 to 1979, silver did basically nothing. And then all of a sudden, 1970 to 1980, the, la the last half of 1979 into the three, first three weeks of 1980, silver just goes crazy. So that's a signal of the public finally waking up, right? The banks wake up, the, finan the financial players who see a little bit deeper what's going on in the derivative system, they, they make their moves in gold before the public finally wakes up. What makes the public wake up? Well, not the derivative markets, the supermarkets. That's what makes them wake up. Then they, they, they go for silver. So we're going to see that at the very, very end. Where silver is going to go in the very, very end, you know, of that of that cycle in the hundreds, maybe even the thousands. I I don't know. It, it depends. These numbers don't really mean anything when the dollar doesn't buy anything. So I, I mean, it's anyone's guess, but I do think that the the ratio at least briefly will fall to fifteen to one, which is what I'm waiting for. And when that happens, I'm just going to buy a bunch of stuff with silver, and whatever I can't buy, I'll just convert back into gold. Recent discussions among financial analysts raise alarms about the implications of reverse repos potentially returning to zero, a scenario not witnessed for most of the past decade. The reverse repo facility has declined as the Fed unwinds pandemic-era stimulus by allowing Treasury and mortgage securities to expire without replacement. This has brought the Fed's overall holdings down from around $9 trillion in mid-2022 to about $7.1 trillion. Most of this balance sheet reduction has been financed by cash, leaving the reverse repo facility searching for more attractive private market rates. After experiencing almost no inflows at the beginning of 2021, the facility peaked at just over $2.6 trillion by the end of 2022. Rafi emphasizes that our economy operates primarily on debt rather than tangible assets like gold. And in an inflationary environment, a contraction in credit could trigger defaults and financial instability. The recent rise in short positions on Treasury securities raises concerns about a potential liquidity crisis, which could lead to rapid asset liquidation, particularly in the real estate market. As reverse repos decline, the excess liquidity supporting the economy may soon disappear, raising speculation about the Federal Reserve's next moves. It's inherent in what credit really is. Um, or how the how the uh, the Keynesian fueled inflationary fueled economy works, right? It, there's uh, it's, we're not really a money based economy. We're a credit based economy, and you know credit is issued, and that's how businesses work, and it's how international businesses work, and there's just circuits of credit with people trusting each other, um, and the the actual money that's supporting it is. A, so that's supporting it all is very, very low, very, very small amount. And if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, the amount of gold is like some like 8% and the rest is just debt, which is credit. And debt and credit are the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. If the credit supply can't shrink and it cannot shrink in an inflationary system, then debt can never really default. Because if it, if, if it defaults or it's paid back and it's extinguished or it can never really be extinguished, then the business cycle turns, you get a bust, they get the bank crises because banks don't lend money, they lend credit these days. Uh, so, what ha so what really happened from about World War II until 2008, uh, the, the credit supply gently increased, uh, the Fed had pretty much control with, uh, within larger cycles of the monetary system and, and, and the circuits of credit kept going. But in 2008, they all kind of fell at the same time. Then you had all of these, all of this bad credit or bad debt, which is really the same thing. And uh, the Fed had to buy it all, put it on his balance sheet in order to keep the banking system going with the fuel that it had been on for the previous decades. And now you have all these bank reserves, right? They, they, took, they took the, they bought the bad credit and they bought it with dollars, right? They said, here, give me, give me the bad debt or the bad credit, whatever, what do you wanna, whatever you want to call it, and we'll give you these dollars and you can put them in the basement. And that's bank reserves. But banks can't just sit on reserves. Every bank competes with every other bank, so they have to earn interest on these things. So they either put them in the derivatives market um, or wherever they fit to earn some kind of interest or they, they put them back in treasury paper, wherever it is they can earn interest, right? And now there, there are so many reserves that they don't even fit in the system because there's not, there's no, there weren't enough. It's, it seems like a crazy statement. 
but there there weren't enough treasury bills to uh, for for all the dollars in the system. And since they couldn't buy treasury bills, then it would cost them money to hold it. So the Fed said, "Give it back to us, and we'll give you interest as if it were tre- as if you were buying treasury bills." And that's a reverse repo. The banks give yes, the Fed <laughs> the banks give the Fed cash. The cash give the banks treasury paper. So say it's basically a treasury bill, just a treasury bill that doesn't exist because they, 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 there's not enough. All right. So the thing is, now the banks are used to having all these reserves. They've put them places different. They've tucked them away, like under mattresses and under this like scary mattresses, not like a mattress that you sleep on, obviously, but like scary derivative mattresses where they have all these reserves. And now all the trades that they've held there are dependent on these reserves uh, funding, continually funding those trades. When the reversed repos run out, that means there's no more excess liquidity that couldn't be sopped up by treasury bills and then reserves start to fall as they get used up. And there's some point in there where things start to unwind. And that's the point where the Fed's going to have to go in again. Exactly what they're going to have to do, I don't know. But uh, last time they went back into repos and there were like $500 billion in repos offered the next the, the next few months, something like that. But the, the balance sheet's going to expand. And then, and then the question is, what is it going to spill into? Last time it spilled into uh, some kind of disease out of China. Let's not speak of it. If that was connected or not, we don't know. And I'm not going to make any uh, claims here, but could have been. We'll see what happens this time. But it's going to be the same story, just like twice as big. Silver is currently in a consolidation phase after hitting a recent high of $34.87, with support at the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement level of $33.09. If it breaks above Friday's high of $34.02, we could see a bullish trend emerge, potentially pushing prices higher. A weaker US dollar and lower treasury yields are boosting silver's appeal to international investors, making it more attractive to them. These conditions could increase prices, especially as market participants seek safe haven assets. As we look ahead, key economic reports, including Q3 GDP data and employment changes, are on the horizon and could significantly impact market sentiment and silver prices. Additionally, China's upcoming parliamentary session may introduce economic stimulus measures, further influencing global stability and creating upward pressure on silver prices. Please share your thoughts on Rafi's analysis in the comments below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.